Well, and the, the other side of this is our beloved higher education infrastructure of colleges and, and universities, and that you uh, you get in, into that a bit about uh, I think the frustrations that you had with the uh, you know the, the bootstrap fallacy, which are, which of course assumes you have boots, right? Uh, <laughs> or, right. or boots that fit. Uh, self levitating. <laughs> Yeah, self learning That's right. Or, uh, you know, or that the response—it's the responsibility of the learner solely to get through that there's these sorts of things. But could you talk a bit about those or other frustrations sure. that you have with the systemic uh, way we do things? What I was trying to do with those examples, and I'll use three of them: bootstrap fallacy is one of them, uh, is that show how we baked into the the dominant perspective about higher education and how you get it and what it takes. And there are, there, there are colleges that don't behave this way and try not to, but, but the point is, you ask the general public, and the reason I would argue that families are suing Harvard and MIT on, on, administrate, on admission discrimination is because not only do they offer great resources, but it's a great brand. And that in a sense, they're suing for the brand or the USC, the whole scandal around USC, that parents were after a brand. And it, part of that brand is that if you succeed, you have made that American dream come true. You've lifted yourself by your own bootstraps. Well, as I said earlier, you know, self-levitation is, is hard to come by. In my world, right. anyway, I can jump, but I usually come back down to earth. Um, and so there's that. And then another is the use of the term persistence. If you go to an emergency room, they don't say, go home and get better and come back when you're, you're able to, you know, your temperature is under 101. They take you as you are when you come through the door. And they, and they, and they actually organize in a, in a crisis by the most serious first. And so, you know, and then you look at higher education where the notion of of, of proceeding is persisting. It's like you're hiking up um, Mount Denali in Alaska um, in sneakers. And, uh, you know, if you're really tough, you'll get to the top in your sneakers. Um, well, uh, somehow, you know, I like to think of the Nordstrom's concierge service where we know with adults, there's a lot going on in their lives and getting the right education and training and the recognition of their learning and all that is a fifth putting a fifth ball in the air for this amazing juggling act. And so I think of the notion as we go forward of a concierge service where it doesn't do the work for you, but it, it, you've got an advocate the way you do in Nordstrom's. They don't persist you to, to, the, to, to the culinary aisle to buy pans. They ask you what are you there for, and then they help you get it. And that's good for them, but it's also good for you. So thinking about our language um, to me is, is the other. And then my third example, which some people really disagree with, which is fine, is English as a second language. If I, so I can go and get a Pell Grant and learn Spanish or French or Latin, or, I don't think we do much of that anymore, but and I'm, I'm good to go and I get three credits and whatever. But if I need to learn English as a second language, I can't get in most places as I understand it, they have changed a little. I can't get Pell Grants. I've got to do that before I can be in, enrolled in a college and a degree program, a certificate program. So is English less important than French and Spanish? Is it, I mean, why in that, and people drop out for that reason, because that's time and money against an unknown payback, you know, payoff. And so we, again, that's something that we do uh, in, and I believe it's, I've thought it was a uniform practice. I, I'd love to be wrong about that. But those are just three examples of things we do that we didn't do to hurt people or use language to make it harder for them or whatever, or have metaphors that are impossible to execute on humanly, like bootstraps, but they have a negative effect in the way we think. And I called, I used to call I talked to faculty and I've done this myself in the past, say, God, I tried. Oh, I tried. But they just couldn't do the, you know. Well, you know, I'm back to the emergency room. You know, occasionally you lose somebody, but you're there to take them where they are, get them where they need to go, and that's that. And, uh, and not tell them to come back when they're feeling better. And yeah, yeah. 
Well, your, your concierge example reminds me of a workshop we did years ago where uh, in the morning that we asked people to pretend they're an adult learner and over lunch call their institution and then report back after lunch. And it was uh, eye-opening, you know, people reporting, you know, getting uh, forwarded six times and then ending up back with the same place they started. <laughs> you know? But, but you're right, yeah, that, that it's, it's a system that's not set up unless you... Yeah, it's not like bad people versus good people. That's not... Right. It, it, it's, a, it's an organizational culture that is organized for one thing, which assumes that campus is the only place you can really learn something other than Benjamin Franklin's public library. Right. Um, and, and the world around you is a, a barren desert. Well, the desert's gone green, and the campus isn't an oasis any longer, and there's a whole bunch of people out there and, in the green desert that want to get some of the action and there's a lot of ways to provide that action in a respectful and, and really qualitative way. Another part of your book is talking about the what you call sort of the underground programs whether it's uh, uh, services or institutions or others who are uh, breaking this mold and trying and trying to uh, help these students providing the concierge service doing something different. Could you talk a bit about those? Sure. Um, I think what's the thing I want to say, the caveat beforehand is there are many more programs yes. like this than I know about. Um, but I think that makes the, the larger point. They're invisible to the general public and you have to happen upon them if you're in need. It, it becomes a sort of incidental how you find out about them. And, and so that's the underground nature of the whole thing. Why I call it a new frontier for learning and work is that I, that we want to figure out a way to make that public. Imagine a public library system where you could go in and get information about all the learning programs, internships, uh, in-house training, you name it, at the community college or in businesses within 50 miles of where you live, and then do something about it. So if we know of, Place has been around for a while, you know, uh, like straighter line. Uh, places where they you can take courses for a fraction of the cost, and you can take them and test out of them as fast as you can go. And then there are now hundreds of colleges that'll take that credit. You know, some people think that's sort of not great. I think it's terrific. If you know it, you know it. And some of it may take larger corporations, but. McDonald's archways to opportunity where they will shoulder the majority of the cost. Walmart's Live Better University. When I was interviewing people, they were, if, if you paid a dollar a day, you were eligible at post-secondary education and they paid the rest of the bill. Wow. There were five participating institutions or 10. They made deals with Fiverr. Amazon does the same thing that I mentioned. Yeah. Target uh, has a new new program of doing something similar. Exactly. There, the new educational programs, like I mentioned, Upward Bound uh, University, where they literally make your life, your work life, your civic life, your background, the curriculum, and they and they uh, build on it. And you do lots of new things too. But what they're also they're incorporating your lived experience into the business of learning how to be a critical thinker, an analytical thinker, a good writer and help you gain, know the skills you have and gain more skills. Um, there are, and I mentioned SV Academy, which is another um, uh, yeah. new new model of, ed, of education, which is directly linked to employment. So their job doesn't end when you finish the academy, the part they're doing. They then send an advisor and a coach with you into the workplace, which has been guaranteed for you if you complete successfully. And that, and it isn't until you've been successful at work for, I think it's a year, maybe a little less, and you go from 60% pay, I'm making this number up, I'm not sure, to, to the real pay for your job, because you're sort of, you're auditioning for the job, but you have a, a, a professional coach the whole way. And you finish the academy when you get the full job, you, you succeed in your audition. Uh, that's all part of the program. It isn't, oh, go find a job and good luck. It's part of a way to set the program up. So there, there, and then there's upward bound. There's all oh, yeah. goodwill. I found a goodwill for instance. Goodwill, yeah. Oh my God, they've got high school students. They do all sorts of things with post secondary education, but they have high school accredited high school programs that 
something like 50,000 people are enrolled. In. It's amazing their outreach, yeah. And, and we just don't know about it. So right. let's let's get it up on the surface and, and, and call it what it is, which is legitimate, valid, qualitative way for people to get someplace um, that they <clears throat> they couldn't have gotten otherwise and make it part of the, the public infrastructure. Um, the, the, or at least the perceived infrastructure, because it's underground right now.